Hello, my name is Cal Moline from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. Yeah, I'm Matt Battaglioli from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. And today we're bringing to you the news from Underground, specifically on a user topic by Crawling on the 4-3. We posted this on the Socialism versus Capitalism video we made. Uh, it's not, what, a It was a little less than, a, it would be two weeks ago on Sunday. Yeah. So he says, nice channel. I agree with most of what you guys say, but what about environmental loss? For instance, I'm from West Virginia and was affected by the chemical spill where 300,000 people went without water for about a month. Then there are the coal fire plants. Without certain environmental regulations and controls, they would be able to emit exhaust with higher levels of lead and other contaminants that would then precipitate back into the water we drink and so on. I always find myself conflicted on this. And I think that's a really good, important question. It is. Um, like, I guess for me, I guess for many people in the terms of, like, understanding capitalism and socialism, they feel sometimes that the government is the only thing that could protect the environment or mm. the animals or wildlife or rainforest and that nature. Um, I guess, did you ever feel that way to uh, yourself growing up? Um, that government was the only answer to environmental problems? Yeah. Um, not in the immediate sense. I always figured uh, things like forests and stuff could uh, be protected privately. Um, there's like, plenty of examples of that. Um, what took me a little while to overcome was uh, things like, like air pollution right. um, and uh, water pollution. But I did eventually realize that, yeah, free market economy can uh, do that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess uh, I guess when you grow up, you hear the wildlife protection agencies, you hear mm -hmm. park rangers, you think that these are the established agencies when you grow up with that are there, I guess, charged with the order of protecting, you know, the environment. And right. So you think that there's something already in place. That and then it also comes back that. to, I mean, we, we see on, on TV all the time and in, in general media, um, you know, uh, uh, capitalists and their, their big factories with the, the smoke. Yeah. and all that stuff and to kind of give us these images of what isn't good for the environment and that stuff isn't good for the environment but um, it all comes down to the incentives that are in place and we've got some horrible incentives in place right now yeah absolutely yeah. Um, and a lot of this stuff has made me relook my old dream I guess when I was in high school I figured I'd move to Alaska become a wildlife fish and game warden and just live my life you know doing the uh, warden game protection of fisheries and wildlife there um, they also had a great degree in uh, Fairbanks for wildlife biology. Mm -hmm. So, but of course, these are the, the norms that I was taught growing up. That yeah, these too. are the only agencies that protect it. But that's only because government has created a disincentive for there to be actually positive, um, I guess, right. um, businesses that don't pollute. Yeah, and now uh, you take like an EPA regulation. Um, I was talking to uh, uh, Holly uh, Fretwell, who's the founder of the uh, Property Environmental Research Center, about this a while ago. And uh, she's telling me about uh, EPA regulations such as mandating certain kinds of smoke tax that completely uh, um, disincentivize any kind of innovation. And then they also say that, well, if this pollutes, then well, that's, that's the okay pollution. And then they'll say every business can pollute this amount, which then encourages people to do that amount mm -hmm. rather than trying to limit it to the lowest it could be. Yeah. So things like that just really act contrary to their own you know, intended ends. Yeah, I, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I think, I guess, before we dwell into how, uh, I guess, capitalism versus socialism, again, a free market um, a solution to these problems. Uh, I guess there's two acknowledgements we have to first face. One is that the fact that there's a lot of air pollution and pollution in right. the water, pollution that there's an abundance of it and doesn't continue to stop, uh, is evidence and shows to prove that government can't restrain it. Right, yeah, that's right. So we'll, we come up thinking these uh, uh, government agencies are meant to, to do this job, and then you can you know measure the success of that, you know, yeah. how well they've yeah. been doing, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I measure the success of uh, other businesses if they continue to provide fast service like internet. Right. Uh, you know, they're not sporadic. It doesn't take them years for them to provide it for me or uh, or any kind of service like that. Um, but in terms of government and these agencies have been around for a long time, uh, pollution has gone and continued to be as pervasive and worse as it as it's be, has begun. Um, so, and I guess the second area would be uh, respect for property rights. Uh, so. Today's, uh, so the first thing I guess I would say to examine any of these kind of questions is to see how it's being provided as a solution today, right? Um, how is, uh, so if government is there to protect you, protect your, your life, your property, and your liberty, so they say, um, then that's, I guess, a way of you can measure success. Uh, you know, that's their job to protect you from that, uh, I guess, aggressiveness, from the initiation of that violence. And so you can say, these particular polluting factories that are polluting the the river and the water that you're drinking, you know, yeah. government has failed in protecting you from that aggression. Uh, only in that, these are particular areas that government uh, do not allow private ownership in. Um, so you can look at uh, does government respect private property, right? I guess you know, clear cut, you know, and of course the answer out there is no. You know, if they did, they wouldn't have eminent domain. If they did, they wouldn't be taking half your income, calling it taxes, you know, or. Um, 
I guess property taxes and oh, oh, I guess like for example there's a gentleman in DC who didn't pay his property taxes government came in DC put a lien in his house foreclosed him and throw him on in the street no respect for private property whatsoever um, so we can have to look at that how it functions today and that doesn't have a respect for private property and let's look and then um, I guess in contrast to what it would look like if there was a respect for private property right. Um, so I guess would you like to start off with the I guess tragedy of the commons or yeah sure um, the tragedy of the commons is basically when something doesn't have an individual owner the incentive that that's then put in place uh, for everybody surrounding that particular resource um, is uh, to get as much out of it as you can as soon as possible um, and the reason that that incentive is what it is is because if you don't get all you can right now then someone else might and there won't be any for you later. Um, and that, that's the case for uh, rivers, that's the case for forests, that's the case um, really anything that is any kind of common pool resource. Yeah, like the mountains yeah. out in West sure. Virginia where they have Absolutely. problems. Yeah. Uh, so you would say, so these, these are areas where there is no clear ownership of. Uh, of course, the government makes the claim that they own all the land. Uh, like the federal government owns one third of it, and a lot of these particular lands in which there's no clear ownership, there's no incentive to take care of, of the land or the environment. Right. Uh, most of the people who are within that bureaucracy are not there, you know, uh, ma maintaining, managing as you would, you know, if it was their own property. Yeah, you know? it doesn't reflect their own wealth. Yeah, it's, it's a bureaucracy. There's just, you know, paper pushing, you know, they're just uh, looking at technicalities. It's not something that they own and take care of and maintain as you would, you know, your own house or your own room or your own car. Um, and actually, so what government does is most of the times they rent out some of these lands. So of course, there's no incentive for a lot of these businesses, uh, I guess factories, to take care of the environment because they don't own it. They're just renting it out for them for like uh, deforestation mm -hmm. or mountaintop removal. Um, so you'll find in these particular areas where there's no right now respect for private property. Yeah, a lot of these, um, you know, there's no incentive to take care of it. So leads to a lot of um, the disincentives that's very creates there's just a lot of pollution in yeah. your river, in your drinking water, in the air you breathe. And so I guess we'll examine, um, I guess what it would be like in a, in a private core system. You know, if someone, if you owned a stream, for example, yeah. and a factory had uh, set itself up further along uh, the ways and you found pollutants in your stream, what kind of recourse do you think you would find in a free and voluntary society? Um, <clears throat> Well, assuming the only thing that's changed is the river becomes privately owned. Um, if that's the only thing that's changed, nothing else changes at all. It's not my ideal world still, but it's, it's closer. Uh, what would likely happen is the owner of the river would uh, see that they're losing their own wealth. It would be the um, health of the water in the, uh, the stream. It would be the fish in the stream that are also owned by the, the, that particular property owner. And as it was reflected uh, very well, actually, in common law in the 19th century, early, tw early 20th century, um, for a little while, um, what a, a person could do at that time would be uh, um, go and get from a court an injunction, which is you know cut it out, um, and then the uh, next, next thing would be compensation. So I want them to stop doing whatever they're doing that's causing this to happen, and I want compensation for what it's cost me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was that um, is a, a much better incentive for businesses than to stop um, doing these uh, uh, polluting activities. Because court costs are expensive, they don't want to have the um, uh, reputational damage that comes from um, engaging in over pollutant behavior that's caused a case like that. Yeah. So um, that's one way, just simply by uh, assigning some ownership to the uh, particular common pool resource, um, that we'd have a, a better uh, result already in environmental issues. Yeah, because otherwise the uh, the government will say, well, that factor is creating a public good. You know, they'll use a utilitarian approach. You yeah. know, so they'll supersede your right to your private property because then you know they won't even define pollution as aggression, as a violation of of the individual of their rights of uh, their bodily integrity. Because mm -hmm. pollution in itself and whatever particles or energy that's um, being, I guess, invading uh, in your territory, your land, or your your lungs. Um, that is causing a negative impact that is aggressing against you. Uh, but of course, the courts today and the socialistic society have no respect for you as the individual for your property property rights. So most of the times they just um, supersede that with, well, this uh, polluting agency is uh, creating a better wealth for the economy. So we're going to, you know, allow them that particular agency to triumph over the individual. They'll say it's for the public good for, for the uh, general being of welfare of everyone. And then also, um, thinking about the public good, just remember that all the public good is is prioritizing certain private interests over other private interests. If you have your house taken by eminent domain for the public good, um, consider that you are still part of the public and you're not better off because your house yeah. has been taken. So is it really the public good? Because if it was public good, everyone would be better off. But the person who's exploited for those purposes is not. 
Right. These are mystic languages to disguise what it is, in fact, what they're doing. Right. Um, um, uh, collateral damage. Yeah. Versus killing people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So they call. It, yeah. Um, here it's a uh, terrorist acts. Overseas it's collateral damage. Mm. You know, it's, it comes with war. Um, so different terms to disguise w what it is that they're actually doing. You know, a little um, abstract, uh, like social so contract theory, for example, mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Different things to disguise the fact that they're trying to pull, you know, one over your eyes. Um, so, and in a free market society, you'll have respect for property, property rights. You'll have a polycentric legal system that's actually fair and impartial, one that you can actually seek out the arbitrator, have kind of rules within communities next to these um, polluting agencies uh, that agree and consent to these particular rules. You'll have, a, a, I guess, a of course, to seek out uh, compensation and uh, I guess retribution for that. Um, and you'll find, uh, I guess, in areas in which that's not permissible, in areas that there is no clear ownership, you'll find a depletion, of course, not just um, the resources, but like fisheries, for example. Yeah. You were mentioning uh, wild, the uh, Hawk Mountain. Yeah, yeah, Hawk Mountain. Um, it was a, a horribly overhunted area back in uh, the 1920s, and then eventually, uh, the government was actually paying people to kill these particular um, animals um, because they were considered pests at the time. So, uh, and 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 con more conservational-minded person um, decided they were going to collect donations, uh, voluntary donations, and uh, purchase this area, and then outlaw on their particular land uh, the uh, hunting of these animals. And now it's a um, now it's a uh, preservation center. Yeah, uh, rich. Yeah, like like they they come well, back yeah. and they're blooming and, and all these I guess raptor birds. Um, so you'll find uh, that's that's what happens when there's a clear ownership of these particulars. You can still have your mountains. You can still have these preservations. Um, and people who have a real incentive in the long term to want to be there and take care of it to to kind of increase its value. And it's a lot more effective than the EPA telling you how big your toilet bowl has to be and all that stuff. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in regards to uh, the comment the user made in West Virginia, they actually found I guess the EPA description of uh, the the spill was not hazardous, quote unquote. So it allowed a loophole for them to get away with. Uh, committing such acts um, you know because they don't consider hazardous I guess you know being as um, hazardous to your health you know as an aggression so you'll find a lot of you know fluffy language in terms of the EPA in terms of government laws that uh, go contrary to prop respect for property rights these are areas to allow exceptions um, and these exceptions are what makes these uh, I guess pollution based companies thrive in um, they seek them out you know that's how that's there's that's why there's such a problem there that's why uh, up north in northern well I guess north of uh, Richmond there was an oil spill and there was uh, actually recently a few days ago and there's concern that it's going to the James River of course if it goes into the James River they have alternative of um, water system in place but you know if that pollution goes into your water who do you sue right uh, you don't own the river yourself I mean you may be harmed yourself individually but there's no sometimes clear case ownership of who to seek um, I guess Li liable for those particular actions. There's no individual even hold responsible. Yeah, no individual held, held responsible for that. Um, so you'll find and that that's generally the solution for a lot of these problems is private vegetation. Um, I guess the appropriation of these unowned uh, resources, uh, unowned public areas that government uh, ill maintains. Um, you know, that's why uh, I guess you'll find a lot of these areas in Detroit right now uh, a lot of public uh, government spaces, they overgrown with a lot of weeds, overgrown with tall grasses, but uh, a lot of individuals there have taken, like, I guess the lawnmower gang is what they call themselves, and they're maintaining it themselves, they're establishing mm -hmm. ownership. Um, so you'll find, if, you know, if you want to, I guess, safeguard the environment, you want to protect wildlife, you want to uh, save the earth, uh, you know, the best thing you can do for it is to uh, abolish uh, socialism, abolish uh, the state that has no respect for, for the environment, has no respect for the um, for you, the individual. I mean, you look at uh, the cost of life that I guess government has done in this so far in this uh, past century, over 250 million people murdered, democide. 262 million 262. in the 20th, 20th century. Um, that is direct murder. That wouldn't even count um, people who um, could potentially have had their lives saved by drugs banned by the FDA. Right. Yeah, and that's that's human life. And you would think that it has greater value than the environment or the wildlife or the mountains or the rivers, but they disregard that. You know. So what makes you think that they do care about these other areas that you do find a value if they don't even value you as the individual? Um, and you'll find again the government is the greater polluter of all the agencies. Subsidies out there. to the military-industrial complex as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you'll find, you know, if you're if you're against polluters, agencies that, that create all these, um, I guess, toxic environments, then we should be against the, the greater greatest polluter of all, and that's the United States government. You know, that's that's statism. That's socialism. Um, like if you're against monopolies, great. Let's be against the largest monopoly yeah. of all, and that is government. The mandatory monopoly. Yeah, violent monopolies. You know, in which uh, you have no recourse to protect yourself from or to cancel or subscribe. Um, so yeah. So when it comes to uh, private property and uh, environmental things, um, uh, issues like that, another thing that property does is allow us to use the Coase theorem in our own uh, personal, um, individualized circumstances, um, which would basically say if someone is over pollutant and uh, their pollutants are trespassing onto the property of another, um, then depending on who owns the the middle ground for how that's getting from from point A to point B, say it's a river or something like that, uh, then there is an incentive for uh, whoever owns that river or, or field or whatever it is to allow um, the original party to pollute somewhat in exchange for uh, monetary compensation, mm -hmm. though not to the extent in which they could uh, typically with the unknown resource, uh, and vice versa for the others to um, uh, act uh, contradictory to the uh, environmental goals. Uh, if the other, if the, if the first party owns the river or whatever that median is, then they would have again, if or exchange for monetary compensation, um, the right to pollute a little bit, but not as much as they typically would. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of how those things self-regulate. Um, it's good for the economy as well um, because that gets um, people into agreements. It gets them trading in uh, a peaceful, and voluntary way. Right. So there's yeah. a plurality of nonviolent solutions and agreements that a lot of people can find in particular these areas. Some people may right. be okay with pollution as long as they are compensated for it. Um, you know, whatever, that's their property, they can sign it however they want to be. The uh, example I think uh, Ronald Coase himself used was, uh, and I could be wrong about that, but I, I'm pretty sure this is what he's, what he's talked about, um, is a, a, a farmer and uh, some fishermen, uh, and uh, the farmer is using too much fertilizer and is getting in the stream and is killing some of the fish. Uh, so if you assign ownership to the, uh, the fishermen of that river, and they can say, okay, look, you can only you know, you do this so much and you're going to pay us for this compensation for that. And I'm like, okay, sure, but not as badly as it would be if they didn't have that possible agreement. And then vice versa, um, okay, you're going to allow me to do this on my end of this, end of the, the bargain, um, and I'll pay you this amount of money mm -hmm. uh, for you to let me uh, do this to whatever the, the river that you own or whatever. And so it, it's just a way of people being able to work out there. Because in order to negotiate with something, you have to own it. You, know, right. uh, you can't negotiate with somebody else's property or unknown property. You have to actually have the authority over it, and that's only uh, possible through private property. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you'll find, and I guess the road of socialism, they find that as well. It's very easy to kind of skirt over the laws, and if you get caught, hey, paying the fines a lot cheaper than having to go through all the process of uh, you know changing your chimneys and putting the filters in there. So there's a lot of leeway to to escape with polluting because of these this monopoly and law system that's in place um, that allows these kind of frauds to to occur. Um, and what uh, Murray Rothbard talks about, especially uh, we're talking about uh, you know, ca uh, cars being a big uh, a pollutant, especially now in the 21st century, uh, they've gotten bigger um, and all that stuff. Um, you can't, you, you, it, it would be ridiculous to try and uh, sue each individual uh, automobile owner for their uh, de minimis amount of, of pollution. Um, but what you could do is if you privatize you know, highways and roads and all that stuff, well, you can say, okay, on this particular road owned by this particular person or organization, there is, you know, three to five times more pollution coming off this road. So, look, that's causing a problem. You got to cut that out. You know, and then that's an incentive for the person who owns the road to say, all right, you can, you can, you know, have a, you know, go uh, six miles per, to the gallon on my road if you want mm -hmm. to, but to use my road, you're gonna have to pay this much more money because this right. is not looking good for me. You know. So that's another way in which uh, you know the private property system really uh, helps uh, regulate the environment in a uh, positive way. Yeah, they can control it into having a pollution to like yeah. set of nil or none to uh, to I guess a comfortable limit. Yeah. Uh, as long as uh, the opposite of that is not being produced to I guess lie on, on their own hands as uh, responsible, like owning the highways of a lot of cars that pollute. But of course, the government has a monopoly on this road, so they in, in effect have. Um, a negative uh, consequence of creating a lack of technologies that could, you know, arise from having a free privatized road system. You know, clean uh, energy cars, for example, um, cars that drive for themselves. Maybe, you know, I guess just like uh, Jeffrey Tucker said, you know, we'd have, um, you know, the Justin's age by now, we'd be fine. Um, but I guess in terms of like fisheries and stuff like that, yeah, they control how the fishing license, how much people are be able to fish in those particular lakes. You know, they maybe perhaps um, they're fishing too much, so they can um, pass another rule saying, you know. 
you know, it's going to be closed for a season until it, uh, you know the fish uh, repletes themselves. Or they'll say you, know, you can kill this many deer, this many animal, or whatever, and then everyone's like, well, let me kill the, let me do the most I can, you know, right. the most out of it that I possibly can do, you know. And that's what ends up happening with right. people find a fear of competition that's not going to be enough out there for for them the next season or the next year, and so they uh, they go out and, and that's where all of this over uh, fishing, over hunting is uh, is occurring, right. uh, especially in areas of the oceans and the waterways which which are not privatized. Um, so. That's uh, that leads to the to extinction um, and the deplorable acts that are done to the environment. I guess the exploitation of resources, as they say. Um, so yeah, if you want to save uh, the planet, <laughs> privatize everything and right. uh, abolish the state. So with that, this is uh, Kyle Molone signing off. Not Bada See you guys at the Victory Party. Take good care.